Good morning to everyone here and uh, good morning, especially to Dr. Leakoff and welcome to Alberta. Um, I know that uh, things are a little later where you are. Uh, you're in Chicago, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And is the weather as glorious as it is here? Yeah. Good, good. Well, it's so great here for the 4-8. Um, our weekend has just been excellent. And I hear that you have been on a foray as well. Yeah, we had one. Um, we had our foray and show this weekend also. Very good, very good. And thank you uh, for you know giving up a, a little bit of your time just before your dinner hour. So I'd like to now introduce you um, and your topic, Fungi in the Tree of Life. Dr. Patrick Leacock is a mycologist documenting the mushrooms in the Chicago region with collections going to the Field Museum of Natural History, where he worked for 14 years and he continues as an associate. He now teaches botany and mycology at the School of Art Institute in Chicago. He assists on forays, as we've just heard, as a scientific advisor for the Illinois Mycological Association and the Wisconsin Mycological Society. He started this, his mushroom activities with the Minnesota Mycological Society a long time ago and obtained his PhD from the University of Minnesota. Patrick served as a voucher coordinator for 20 years documenting fungi at the NAMA annual forays. Visit Patrick's website. Now, it's a very easy website address, so that's why I put it in here. It is www.mycoguide.com for more information about his service to science and to mycology in particular. So welcome, Dr. Leacock. Um, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Martin, and everyone for the invitation and um, chance to speak with you. It's uh, Bonderzulia, or Bonderzefia, I should say, Bonderzefia. It's named after... Dr. Bonderzeff, this is a big polypore that's on the ground. We found a few smaller ones and this, uh, somebody found this bigger one at, um, we went to a Cook County Forest Preserve um, on the north side of Chicago for several hours with 60 people and found a whole bunch of stuff. And then we brought that stuff over to the Chicago Botanic Garden for our annual mushroom show on Sunday, uh, that was yesterday and we had, um, good group of people come through and ask all sorts of questions. Had a lot of good volunteers helping out, um, but we had um, a big array of tables with all the fungi on display with names and everything on them. But um, this Bonder Zephia is a polypore, what we call a polypore, because it's got all these pores underneath and it's got sort of a stubby base stem type stuff. So it kind of grows like a sulfur shelf or a hen of the woods type thing where it comes out of the ground and then makes these um, shelves in a rosette. Um, but this is actually in a different group from the other polypores. This is not related to the, uh, most of the other polypores. This is actually related to Russula and Lactarius in the Russulales. So Bonders Zephia has its own family with a few other odd things, but that family is in the order Russulales with the um, um, with the Lactarius and Russell and things related to those. Other odd things in there are like the Artemisia's coral and uh, Lentinellus, um, um, some other odds in it, a bunch of other odds and ends in that order. So it's a separate order from um, the Agaricales, which is where a lot of the other mushrooms are in. And we only have a dozen records of this for Chicago, so it's, it's always nice to find it. So um, other thing that's neat, if you do microscopy, uh, because this is in the Russulales and related to Russulalacterius, if you look at the spores under the microscope, it'll have the amyloid um, dark blackish um, warts on the spores. So the spores look like Russula or Lactarius spores with little um, warts that stain dark in the um, Nolzer's reagent. Um, so that's out on my porch drying. The other, um, the rare thing we found, which is on my, I put on my mushroom dryer, so it's mostly dried down now, but this is uh, fistulina hepatica. 
the bee stake polypore. This is another polypore with um, tubes underneath, but the tubes are actually um, um, more separate. Um, so the growth of the tubes is different and it's got a little stubby stem here. And this was found at the base near a tree. It grows on either live or dead um, trees, um, either on the side of the tree or the base of the tree. Um, and Fistulina hepatica is not very common. And um, for some reason, we haven't found it before in the Chicago area. I, ha I have been um, accumulating all the data for the mushrooms and macrofungi for Chicago region. And we have herbarium records um, from an active group of professionals back um, 100 years ago. And they, they don't have a record of this. They have a record of the Pseudofistulina, um, which is a, a related um, species in a different, but it's a separate genus now. It's got a longer stem. But this is our first record of this Fistulina hepatica um, for Chicago. There are some records up in Wisconsin and out east and other places. Oh, and the other thing about Fistulina is it's not, it's also not related to the other polypores. It's in the Agaricales. So it's related to guild mushrooms. It has its own family with a couple other things. So these are two odd mushrooms that you might think are regular polypores, but they're not related to most of the other polypores. So that's a one item about diversity where you have similar growth forms, but they're not necessarily related together. Um, so we'll see a little bit of that at the end of the talk maybe, but um, this talk is mainly about how fungi fit in with um, the other forms of life, especially plants and animals, and how those relationships shake out based on our current knowledge. Not that, this one. So um, there's a link on this talk. Um, so my, my, my website is mycoguide.com. But if you go to the um, directory fun tree, so it's mycoguide.com slash fun tree, there's a web page associated with this talk that has a lot of the links. So I'll be mentioning some of these links um, and videos here that'll give you more information on this topic. Um, there's several really great ones here. This one on Archaea is really nice. There's this um, Tree of Life website talks about pretty much everything now. Um, very long web page talking about um, viruses and protozoa and bacteria and fungi and animals and plants and all the way up to humans. So lots of different um, information and tons of links to other web pages that talk about how things are related to each other. So check that out. And then, um, so my talk is on the fungi and the tree of life and the diversity of fungi, how, they, how this all fits together. Um, so this is that link to that webpage I have, uh, fun tree. So you can check that out when you have time. So this is sort of what I'm covering today in this talk. So comparing fungi to animals and plants, um, changes in the tree of life over time, and how when fungi became their own kingdom, they were called the fifth kingdom by some people because they were a new fifth kingdom. Um, but that system is um, modified now. We have a lot more than five kingdoms. And we actually have a new domain um, level above kingdom. So we have two or three domains above the kingdom level. And we have a lot of different levels that fit in between kingdom and division and um, phylum and all that. So we have a lot of these groups called supergroups. So it's a way to organize things together above the level of kingdom and above the level um, at the top level inside a kingdom or either inside or outside a kingdom. So those are super groups. They're not, they're um, groups of related things, but they're not official nomenclature names. So there's no real rules on how to assign these names, but um, it's useful for tying things together. Um, I'll also talk to you about the diversity of lineages and compare that to diversity of species. It's a little bit different with some of these groups. 
And at the end, I'm going to look at the major groups of fungi, um, including the mushrooms. So here's our roadmap for where fungi are in relation to um, the supergroups and the domain above the kingdom of fungi. So we're going to stop at, start at the top with these domains and work our way down through the unicons and the opisticons and into uh, fungi and a few things related to fungi. Um, one thing I should mention is um, if you ever get a chance at a foray, you may see someone use this phylogeny tree that was made by David Hibbett. Um, he's in the um, process of updating this because this, um, these relationships of fungi um, change over time as we sequence more different species and groups and we find more details on how things are related. So he was going to update this before he made it available online. So I have to ask him if he's done that. But we had this tree. Um, somebody brought the tree here to the Nama Forey in Colorado uh, last month. But it's a way to look at the relationships of the fungi. And then you put your samples of fungi or mushrooms on the left side of the tree there for the different um, families and see how things are um, related. One of the videos I recommend you watch is this one on entire, the Earth's entire history. Um, it shows from the beginning of Earth through time and how a lot of these, the animals, plants, and fungi are fairly recent on the Earth, about um, one half to one billion years ago is when they started. So the, um, in the video, they have fungi at, point, uh, at uh, 5,600 million years ago. Um, or half about a half a billion, but the origin of fungi is um, around, currently we think it's around 760 million to 1 billion years ago, about the same time um, plants and animals diverged. Um, and this early divergence was in the ocean. This was way before anything was up on the land. So these are all aquatic um, organisms when plants and animals and fungi started. So, the fungi, classification of fungi and where they fit has changed over time. So in the beginning with Carl Linnaeus and his, um, his um, nomenclature system with binomials and all that, he put fungi in the plant kingdom and he didn't describe very many fungi. Um, he only had 11 different genera and not too many species. There's um, people like Fries and Pursun after Linnaeus that described a lot more fungi and worked out um, what we use uh, or modified for the classification of fungi. But back, in, back at that time, there were two kingdoms, the animals and the plants, and fungi were in the plant kingdom. Um, and then we realized that bacteria um, were separate and protozoa were separate. And then we had fungi separate. So that's how we got five kingdoms. And now we have a lot more kingdoms as we're doing G, um, DNA sequencing to figure out how things are related. Um, Carl Woes, I'll show, has, um, he made a major impact on um, developing this idea of domains of the top level, basically the top level um, classification of groups for all life is in two or three domains. And um, other evidence is showing that the protista or protozoa, all these little, um, mostly a lot of aquatic single cell to simple organisms are actually a bunch of different lineages and they're still being separated into different kingdoms. Um, that is still being worked out as to how many kingdoms we have in the protozoa. It might be 10 or 20, I don't know. Um, one, the big takeaway is that fungi are not related to plants, they're related to animals instead. And fungi and animals are related to the mycetozoa, which is the amoeba group and the slime molds. And then there's some other organisms that are related to um, animals and fungi, but aren't quite admitted into, the, into those kingdoms yet. They're kind of on the outside. So plants, animals, and fungi are three major kingdoms or groups, and their life histories and reproduction and all that are different and how the organisms develop um, cells and tissues is different. So you're familiar with plants and animals, uh, probably more than fungi. Plants are what I would call modular. 
they're made of stems, leaves, and roots. These are like um, organs or sets of tissues. And a plant does not have a, most plants don't have a defined number of stems or leaves or roots. It's just um, a modular growth where the stem can make more leaves and the roots can make more roots and the, the stems can make roots and sometimes the leaves can make stems and roots. And it's just um, more like a tinker toy thing where it just keeps adding on parts. Whereas most animals have a body plan, um, usually symmetrical in some way, a uh, certain number of um, body parts, certain number of legs and so forth. Um, and they have tissues and organs. But fungi are very simpler, uh, much simpler in their growth form. They are either single cells like a yeast or they are filaments of cells. So the mush a mushroom in every structure made by a fungus that's visible is made out of threads. There's no tissues or no true tissues. They do have these thread hyphae um, that will stick together and branch, but they're not dividing um, sideways. They're only dividing at the tip. So these filaments can branch and just get longer, but they're not dividing sideways to make it a true tissue. Um, there's differences in their nutrition and some of the other cellular organiz organizations. Um, here's uh, basics here. Animals and fungi are what we call heterotrophs. That means they feed on something else. So most animals have ingestive nutrition. They're, um, they're eating something. Fungi are um, eating stuff on the outside of their cells. So they have absorptive nutrition where they, sent, they secrete enzymes outside of their cells, break down the stuff, and then bring it back into the cells. But um, most animals are actually doing that, but they have internal digestion, which is a weird way of turning part of your outside surface onto the inside to make a digestive tract. And you're still secreting enzymes out into the digestive tract and then absorbing the breakdown product. So that's the... It's also absorptive nutrition, but it's done inside of inside your body. Um, but it's actually outside of your body in a way too. Um, the um, plants are autotrophs. Most plants make their own food with photosynthesis. Um, there's a difference in flagella. If flagella are present, um, animals and fungi have a similar flagellum, whereas plants have two or more um, flagella that are different. Storage is different. Um, fat and glycogen versus oils and starches. Um, animals don't have cell walls. Fungi and plants have cell walls. Um, fungal cell walls have chitin and glucans and other things, whereas plants have cellulose and lignin to make wood or heavy, uh, thick cell walls. So it's a different kind of carbohydrate. Um, life cycles are all over the place. Animals are mostly diploid. Um, I have a whole nother talk on this topic of life cycles with fungi. Um, plants mostly have what we call an alternation of generations. There's one generation that's diploid like animals and one have one generation um, that is haploid, just one set of chromosomes. Um, fungi have a whole lot of different life cycles, different combinations. One thing to keep in mind is the mycelium of a fungus is the living part that grows day to day, year to year, over the decades or thousands of years, however old it is. Whereas the mushrooms there on the bottom of the slide, those are temporary structures made above, usually above ground, um, out in the open, so they can release spores into the wind. So these are reproductive structures for spore dispersal. They're not the main part of the fungus. They're um, analogous to what we say are apples on an apple tree. But in the case of fungi, the apple tree is underground or in the log. You don't see the whole apple tree. Um, you just see the apples sticking out of the log in the case of these mushrooms. There's a whole lot of different trees of life on the web. You can search tree of life and see all sorts of things. Um, um, Darwin sort of started off when he was thinking about his ideas about evolution. Uh, his early tree there is on the top left. Um, some of the early trees had this hierarchy, like the top center, with the most um, complex organisms, including humans, up at the top of the tree, and the more simpler things down at the bottom. Um, 
And then there's other trees like the one on the top right that try, try and show some of the interconnections between these different lineages. Um, there's other trees like in the bottom left that show, have a timeline along with the, the divergence of these lineages. And then there's um, an experimental tree, this fractal tree of life. There's a website for that, which tries to force all these branching patterns into a fractal pattern. It's interesting experiment, but it doesn't really quite work because um, the um, relationships of things don't fall into a fractal pattern of branching. Um, so there's complex trees that try and show you everything. And then there's some simpler trees like on the right, which is quite nice. I was looking at these earlier um, this morning and both of these trees have little problems with them, but um, that's because um, our knowledge of how things are related keeps changing. So especially some of the basal um, relationships and near the bottom of the tree, um, um, our understanding keeps growing uh, how to better to fit these things together. But the one on the right is good at showing you the major groups. We've got the archaea on the top right and then the bacteria on the right. And then the rest are eukaryotes with the protists on the bottom center and then the plants and fungi and the animals. And you show, it shows how they're related together. So we have these, the trees nowadays are based on DNA phylogenies, which is DNA sequences where we get the um, genetic code from a particular sequence of a gene or uh, um, the ITS, the intertranscribed spacer region. Particular um, gene sequences are processed and then we get that code and then we put all these in a um, computer program to sort out what thing, how things are related based on these uh, their similarities and differences in the code. So that's a modern phylogenetic or molecular um, phylogeny is based on DNA sequences. Before we had that information, we based phylogeny on morphology and chemical characters um, and other types of characters, basically any characters we had beside with, along with morphology. Um, and that's a lot more subjective on how we interpret morphology. So the, the polypore example, you have polypores that were all put in the same group, but now we know um, different polypores are in different orders, different orders, different families. And they're related to guild mushrooms and other growth forms like coral mushrooms. Um, there isn't any particular growth form that is, um, I can't think of any that are restricted to one family. So um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of phylogenies. One thing is usually on the bottom or on the left is the base of the tree and then it branches out. And then on the ends of the branches, they have the names of the groups or the species or whatever it is that they're representing. So this is a very simple tree um, with the bacteria and archaea um, on the left and then the eukarya or eukaryotes there. And that's divided into the protists, plants, fungi, and animals. And this is showing fungi animals related and then the plants are outside of that. Um, and then the protozoa here is an example of a polyphyletic, that means multiple branches, so multiple origins. So the, you can't put all the protozoa or protists in one kingdom because there's different lineages there um, that are separate. Fungi and animals and plants are um, each, those are three different kingdoms. But these domains, that's the new level, um, higher level above kingdom with the bacteria archaea being two groups of prokaryotes. Um, and then the eukaryotes are all in the eukaryote domain, eukarya. Uh, Whitaker was very influential in helping us figure out how to classify things into kingdoms and larger groups. And this was his idea that he had back in 1969. So that's, um, that's like 40, more than 40 years ago now. So this is, this is what I uh, learned in college way back. And um, it was a nice way to organize things, but the main way he organized was on mode of nutrition, which is an interesting idea that works uh, for lar in large part, but it uh, breaks down at some of the um, 
more finer divisions. But he's got the plants on the left that have um, their autotrophs. And in that lineage there, he's got other autotrophs like the brown algae, red algae there, the phaophyta, rhodophyta, rhodophyta up there, and the green algae. And then he's got a little branch for euglena, which is a very odd thing that both ingests food, but also has chloroplasts for photosynthesis. In the center, he's got the fungi for absorptive nutrition and some related things like the, or similar things like the oomycetes, the water molds there. But the, it turns out the water molds are related to some other protozoa and not related to fungi at all. He's got the slime molds there. Um, and then he's on the right, he's got the animal, animal lineage with um, various things that have ingestive nutrition. So that's one way to look at um, before, this was before we had DNA sequencing. Um, Carl Woese um, worked out um, and published in 1977 his idea about these domains, especially archaea. So he was the first major person that showed that we actually have two different groups of what we were calling bacteria. So he had, um, back then, we had got it split into ar ar archaebacteria and the eubacteria, which means the true bacteria. And now that's been simplified to bacteria and archaea. But the archaea are like bacteria, but they're a totally separate lineage of prokaryotes. Um, the chemistry and everything is, is, is different. And th there are not as many archaea species, and they're mostly in, in extreme environments. So it's kind of thought that they are more abundant in the past, but um, are sort of shoved into extreme environments, um, um, probably because they can't compete as well with bacteria. And then on the bottom there, we've got the third domain, the eukarya, and all the eukaryotes are down there. There's a lot of different lineages there with the protozoa, and on the very tip there on the bottom left is the fungi, animals, and plants. So you can see, see if you look at this whole tree, the things we're familiar with, animals, fungi, and plants, are just tip of one part of one branch of this whole, of this whole tree of life here. This is another um, diagram showing the three domains. We've got the eukaryotes on the top with different supergroups there. And the archaea is that yellow group on the lower left and the lower right, we've got the bacteria. Um, Part of the um, interesting history of these organisms is that um, this, um, you can look this up online. Endosymbiosis is the theory that our um, organelles of bacteria, of mitochondria and chloroplasts originated as engulfed bacteria that then became um, symbiotic within the cells and stuck around and became dependent on within a cell. And that led to development of the eukaryote cell with our organelles in it. But um, the bacteria, the um, mitochondria came from a particular lineage of bacteria there with the one asterisk on the left, on the right there, where you can see a particular lineage matches up with its DNA sequencing with um, mitochondria. And then there's a different lineage with the cyanobacteria that gave us uh, chloroplasts in the algae and the plants. Um, there's a lot of trees out there, and our knowledge of this relationships change. So some of these trees you'll find will have various types of errors in them that are now corrected, I guess you could say. Um, but some people, um, this tree on the bottom from 2005 is quite popular online. There's a lot of different people that use this tree and modify it a bit. There's a modification in the top center there, that purple um, diagram, that's a modification of this lower tree, and they introduced even a couple more little errors. The correct version I uh, put in the top right there that shows animals and fungi related, and then slime molds outside of that, and then plants outside of that. So fungi are not related to plants, they're related to animals. Here's another tree. Um, Bacteria on the left, archaea in the center, and eukaryotes on the right. And we've got um, two groups of these prokaryotes. That means before the nucleus or before the kernel. So these prokaryotes are two different groups 
of simple, mostly single cells, um, what we think of as bacteria, but there's actually another group called archaea that's um, similar, but chemically different. And these two groups are very ancient. The early life was bacteria archaea, and then the eukaryotes came along much later. And there's different lineages of the um, eukaryotes there, which we'll talk about. So we've got, this is a branching pattern for the supergroups of the eukaryotes. On the top, we've got the uh, bacteria archaea down on the bottom there and the prokaryote line on the very bottom of the tree. But um, this is showing six different supergroups. Um, one thing to note here is that all these kind of branch um, from the, the base there, uh, because we don't know the branching pattern of these different supergroups, because this is such an ancient divergence, we don't have enough data to say which of these supergroups is related to another one, except for the uh, fungi and animals. So the epistochants there on the bottom left, the epistochants have the animals and fungi. And then the next neighbor outside of that is the amoebozoa. And that group includes the amoeba and the slime molds. So next time you see a slime mold or an amoeba, you can think, oh, hey, you're sort of a cousin for animals and plants. Sorry, animals and fungi. And then you can see plants there in the top left center um, with the green algae and red algae. And then there's three other supergroups of these protista groups. Um, so there's a lot of different trees that show this. Um, this one website that I'm recommending, the Tree of Life Tangled Roots and Sexy Shoots, has tons of different trees illustrating these different relationships. You can check that out. One um, split in the eukaryotes is the bicons and unicons, which is sort of a nice binary division for the different supergroups in the eukaryotes. And it turns out it's not quite as simple as that, but I'm gonna use it um, later in a diagram because it's um, a little more simpler. But um, the unicons are all one group, but it turns out the bicons um, are two different, have a couple different lineages. And the unicon refers to one flagellum and bicon refers to two flagella. Um, and we'll show a diagram of that later, but there, people are um, doing more evident, doing more research on this and finding out the finer details of how these different groups are related. But the, but the fungi and animals there are in the unicon group and the plants are in the bicon group along with some of the other algae and protozoa. So, Animals and fungi, if you put those two kingdoms together, you get the supergroup of epistochants. And episto means in the rear, and cons is a pole, like this fellow that's pushing the um, boat through the canal. Um, that's a cont or a pole. So these animal and fungi lineages, if they have a flagellum, it's going to be a single flagellum at the um, posterior or at the Back end of the back end of the cell, and it pushes the cell through the water instead of pulling the cell through the water like some algae. So here's different kinds of flagella arrangements. Um, basically, A and B there on the left are are some fungi, most um, aquatic fungi like the chytrids. They have one flagellum in the rear, and then in the center there we've got some different. Um, um, heterocons. Heterocont refers to having two different flagella. Um, so the two flagella are of different types. One of the flagella um, has ornamentation, uh, little scales on it. And the bottom there shows bicons where you've got two flagella. Um, so there's a lot of variation in, this, in the flagella arrangement in, across all the protozoa and the plants. But the animals and fungi that have um, Flagella are fairly simple with just one or multiple in the, in the base of the cell. So we had this nice three domain system started by Carl Woese, and now it's more complicated because with more group, more um, work by a bunch of different groups um, confirming each other's findings. Um, instead of three domains, um, it looks like we're gonna end up with two domains 
or however they wanna shake out the classification. Um, so on the left is um, the three domain tree. So if you're a fa um, fan of three domains, this is how you do it. You have the bacteria there at the bottom and the eukaryotes there, that green triangle outside of the archaea. All those other groups there are different archaea groups like the Uriarchaeota, Crenarchaeota, and so forth. Those are different groups of archaea type prokaryotes. On the right is showing a new um, version, a new idea of how the eukaryotes there, that green triangle, are actually related to a particular group of archaea. So they're within the archaea tree. Um, they're out, they're um, outside a certain lineage of, of archaea, but they're within the, the whole archaea domain. And this is getting better support with more work. And the first lineage that was found to be next to eukaryotes is the Loki archaeota there. I don't know if you can read the fine print there. But the Loki archaeota um, is named after Loki, the trickster god. Um, um, you probably know him from the Marvel movies. He um, gave the name for this particular lineage of archaea that were just mostly discovered by what, they, what we call environmental sequencing or environmental sampling. You take water and soil samples and you do a, a big um, DNA analysis and find um, DNA sequences from organisms that are in there. You don't have any clue what the organism looks like, but you have a DNA sequence or more than one sequence from that organism and you discover new species and new, actually whole new lineages of organisms. So in this case, a lot of these archaea are known from environmental sampling. So our knowledge of this group is really exploding. And it turns out there's other lineages that are related to the Loki archaeota. So clever people decided, well, let's call that the Odin archaeota and the Thor archaeota, and let's put them all in Asgard uh, lineage, which is the city where they lived. So we have these... Um, um, new lineages of archaea that are um, related and named after the different gods in that mythology. So anyway, this two domain system is um, gaining a lot of traction. So here is um, a tree from 2016, which I like a lot. But one, the major thing to keep in mind here is this is showing diversity of lineages, not the diversity of species. So these, all these branching patterns here are not indicating how many species are in each of these groups, but the branching relationships of these different groups is showing how there's a lot of diversity of lineages in the bacteria. So the whole top of that tree, the right, the right side is purple and the left side there, that's all bacteria. Um, and then the archaea are on the bottom part there and that green wedge on the bottom right are all the eukaryotes. So if you look at this whole tree, you can see that the bacteria, which are really ancient, have a lot of diverse lineages. And the red dots on the tree here show environmental samples. So these are organisms that are only known from their DNA sequencing. They're not, they haven't been isolated onto a petri dish to see what they look like. They're, they're just known from DNA in the environment. And a lot of the archaea there are known from that. And also this whole other group of bacteria there on the right, this whole huge group of bacteria are mostly environmental samples. But the eukaryotes, the protists, the plants, animals, and fungi are this little green wedge because they're a much more recent divergence um, that originated within the archaea. So you can see they branch out from within the archaea and um, became um, more complex cells with organelles and all that. And then that group took off um, and colonized the land and everything else. So, but they're a more recent group. So as far as um, the scale of time, they're not as diverse, but they are a, re a more recent kind of explosion of diversity in a way. So because that other tree shows diversity of lineages, I was, I didn't realize at first that it's not really showing diversity of species, like how many species are in these groups. So I decided to make these pie charts for my class 
on how many species are estimated in these different groups. So here's the, and we're gonna break this down in different levels. So this first chart is uh, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. There's about a million, more than a million prokaryotes, about 10 million eukaryotes. If we break this down again, we get the three domains and the domain archaea are actually fairly small. There's only about 25,000 archaea. Um, and 1 million bacteria. So you'll see other estimates for bacteria, but the more recent estimates are going down because people keep finding the same bacteria around the world. So um, some people don't think bacteria are actually quite as many species as we thought before. We break that down another level, the eukaryotes, we split the eukaryotes into the bicons and unicons. You can see that green wedge are the bicons. These have um, two or more flagella and the unicons that big blue, um, that's three fourths of the pi, that's the unicons. We break these groups down, we'll get the plant kingdom and then the protozoa in the bicons. So we got two wedges there. The plant kingdom you can see is not all that big compared to the whole pi and the protozoa group there is um, no, is, is, there's more species of protozoa than there are plants, which is interesting to think about. Um, and if we, the first split for the unicons is taking out the amoebozoa um, separate from the epistocons. And you can see the amoebozoa again are a nice, a very tiny little piece of about 25,000 species. And that's the slime molds and the um, amoeba. So this last split, um, is splitting the epistocons, and you can see that most epistocons are animals, and that but there is a fairly big wedge of fungi, and this is the lower estimate for fungi at one and a half million. There's estimates that go up to three million, so um, you can take different numbers and make different pie charts based on what you want to use for the numbers. But the animal kingdom is the most um, species rich for the um, living species and then fungi are next and then plants are after that. So there's more species of fungi than there are plants, but there's a lot more animal species than any of the other groups. So this is a little bit on the diversity of fungi. Some early estimates were about um, 100,000 and now um, more current estimates are anywhere from one, one and a half million to three million or more species of fungi. But the problem here is that um, we only know about close to 100,000 species that are published with names. So we only know somewhere between three and 6% of the species of fungi. So there's a lot of cryptic fungi out there um, and also some mushrooms. We get describe new mushrooms each year. Um, a lot of, uh, so most fungi don't have names. Um, and a lot of those are microscopic fungi that we don't know about. The slime molds are the group that are outside of the fungi and animals, and they have an interesting life cycle with um, swarm cells that have flagella. They can swim around if there's enough water, and then they, they mate, join together, and then make that big, big amoeba that grows through the soil or the log eating bacteria. And then that makes the spore producing structures, which we, which we find in the woods. Um, so the original organism type for fungi and animals is thought to be a simple amoeboid cell with a flagellum, and it would ingest food like in um, bacteria. So it would eat bacteria kind of like a, a slime mold. So that's the early idea of what the original ancestor for animals and fungi might be like. Um, so this tree shows some of the more obscure groups that are outside of the animal kingdom. So on the top there is the animal kingdom and then the fungi kingdom are the lower part there. And there's some other groups, the quantiflagellates and the and these quantas, there's three lineages of the quantozoa. Those are outside of the animal kingdom. Um, and then there's some other groups that are outside of the fungus kingdom. And, um, I don't know how that's going to shake out if they'll eventually be put in the animal kingdom or the fungus kingdom to make it simpler. Otherwise, they're going to need their own kingdoms. So 
um, the Quanazoa would end up as being three different kingdoms. Fungi, there's five sort of groups or classical groups for fungi. The basidial mycota have most of the mushrooms that you're familiar with. The ascal mycota have the cup fungi and morels. And then there's the what was called the basal fungi. These are microscopic fungi, the um, glomer mycota, the zygomycota, chytrid, and the chytrids. And these were lumped into three groups, but it's actually more complex than that. Um, and there's a whole new group that was discovered by Meredith Jones and her team in England with water samples. She found a whole new group of um, unknown fungi. So they're called the cryptomycota, which means hidden fungi. Um, and that's that big red triangle down at the base of the fungi that are a whole new group of aquatic fungi that are that are sort of like um, chytrids in that they have a flagellum, but you can see the chytrid lineages are split up into six or seven different groups. Um, and I'm not gonna go into detail here, but so this is the overall view of fungi. Um, at the top, we have the ascomycota and there's different lineages there. And then you can see the the Cidiomycota with the other red asterisks, that's in the other group that has mushroom type macrofungi in there. And then outside of those two is the Glomermycota. They form arbuscular mycorrhizae, which is the mycorrhizal type that's on most plants. And then below that are all these other microscopic fungi in different lineages. Um, and a bunch of those are called chytrids because they have a flagellum in their uh, aquatic swimming stage which might be a spore or some part of the life cycle where they swim around. Um, these major groups have differences in where they live and the cellular organization and number of species. You can see the ascomycetes are the biggest group and there's about twice as many ascomycetes as basidiomycetes. Um, I'm gonna go through these real quick just to sh show you some pictures. So here's chytrids. Um, they're mostly single cells. There's a, some variation here. And a lot of them are parasites on um, plants or little aquatic things like pollen and algae. The zygomycetes include um, black bread molds. So you've probably seen that one or other types of molds out there. Um, the glomermycota are mycorrhizal. So they're down on plant roots and they don't form any mushrooms or structures. They just make really big spores in the soil. But they're crucially important for most plants as mycorrhizae. Then the ascomycota, those make spores inside of an ascus. Um, and those asci reproductive cells are inside of a cup or a chamber, um, like a cup fungus or a morel. And there's different groups of the ascomycetes. The pizizomycetes have the ones we know about, like the cup fungi and the morels. Um, there's a whole bunch of lichens in this group. Um, they're symbiotic fungi with algae. And then we've got another big group, the Sordariomycetes. These include all the carbon fungi, including cordyceps and um, dead man's fingers and things like that. And they make their spores inside of these chambers. And then the Basidiomycota have a lot of different types of basidia or reproductive cells. The jelly fungi especially, and rusts have a bunch of different basidia types. The mushrooms, um, regular mushrooms generally have the standard basidium type on the top there. Uh, but there's lots of different agarics, a lot of lineages of mushroom groups. Um, so that's um, a tour of fungi in relation to the other organisms. So we have um, fungi are in the domain eukarya, um, they're in the unicons, they're in the epistocons with the animals, and they're in the holomycota with other fungus related things and they're in the kingdom fungi. So I'm gonna stop there and then we can get some questions. So I will um, repeat your question as you, as you pose it to Patrick. Martin? Um. One question I have with some of this stuff that uh, that they're just that they don't know what the, the species look like. Do they know some of the roles they're playing? Like obviously, 
they're sitting in a forest floor and doing something. Do we know what they're doing? Um, the roles of these or what they're doing ecologically would just be a guess based on what they're related to. Um, and if they're able to do more like genetic sampling and match up and get a genome, like the whole genome of a thing or most of a genome, you can look for other genes to see what kind of proteins and things they're making. And you can try and figure out more of what they're doing based on their molecular machinery. Like what, are, I mean, can they make enzymes to break down wood or are they have the enzymes for mycorrhizal stuff? So eventually some of those can be figured out that way. But um, also people have to figure out how to isolate these into a living culture because some of these unknown things, we don't know what they require to live. So we don't know what kind of, it would all be experimental to try and get them into culture. It sounds like a walk through the forest and wondering what's going on there is way more complex than we can, we can get our heads around. Yeah. Yeah, we just see the mushrooms and stuff. We just see a very little part of what's actually going on down in the wood or down in the ground. We don't see all the other fungi that are living in the cells of the tree leaves and the plants. There's a lot of these endophytic fungi that are in one fungus individual in one cell of a leaf. And that's, they stay there hanging out until that leaf dies and then they'll start growing and decompose the leaf. So Daldinia, the carbon balls is one group that does that. They hang out in cells in a tree. Um, and then when you cut that oak tree down to make shiitake, sometimes the, the daldinia comes ahead and colonizes the wood ahead of the shiitake because it's already there in the wood. And the importance of this kind of work, the phylogeny and the study of the tree of life is um, that often with humans, we need to name something, place something in some format and some organization to as a starting point. And once we have that starting point, then we study where it fits and how it con makes a contribution to the rest of the organism. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so part. Yeah, before we kill it, that is actually uh, one yeah. thing that's been missing in, society, in scientific study with the kind of the willowing away of uh, phylogenists that we don't know what's out there. Uh, we don't know, we know five to 6% of the fungi and if we only know so few, then they mustn't exist. And so that is the importance of studying the tree of life. And um, I mean, each of you probably have taken away something, but one thing that I found quite astonishing was that when uh, the three domains might be willowed down to two, that the eukaryotes were placed with the archaea, which that I found fascinating. Um, it, yeah, it's it's a bit humbling. Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we came, our eukaryotes came from somewhere. It's just interesting that they came from the oddball group. Yes. Uh, yeah. The prokaryotes. And it, I mean, there's a bunch of chemical similarities between the archaea and the eukaryotes. So that also supports that. Um, the other thing about figuring out where things fit is if you know, like you get penicillin from this particular fungus, you can figure out which fungi are related and find similar okay. compounds that might be useful. So you can, you can, um, so there's a lot of what they call, um, bioprospecting from environmental samples. You're out there finding things to figure out useful chemicals from this stuff. Mm -hmm. Dean was commenting on something that's actually very per pertinent to all of us, and that's where viruses fit. They uh, depend upon other life forms and uh, can't live on their own and are not found in this tree. So her question is about where they fit and how can they fit into this tree at all? Um, they're a separate group of stuff, and some people like to think of them as living cells or living things, and other people, I'm in more in the other camp, where they're like, there's like a little machine, mm -hmm. um, and it gets into a cell and programs that cell to make more copies. It's like a, a computer virus, because yeah. we name computer viruses after viruses, because they're, they're a way to get more copies and spread. So they're not, they don't fit some of the um, requirements of life if you want, but it def depends on how you define life. So they don't, they don't self-replicate. They don't, um, they don't really go through a life cycle other than getting in a cell and making and copies. Yeah. 
So, but that um, that one website, those Tangled Shoots website, has a whole section at the start now about viruses. Mm -hmm. Okay, I um, would like to call uh, this meeting to a close, and I would like to uh, express my appreciation and the appreciation of uh, the Alberta Mycological Society and the attendance here from GAP for your um, generosity in joining us here yeah. in Alberta. Thank you so much, Patrick. And yeah, just a fun. little round of applause for you.